Hi, everybody. This is Scott Dawson. I'm Dean of the Orfield College of Business, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our, our webinar on the tremendous opportunity that the field of business analytics presents to us. Our agenda today, we're going to first meet our speakers briefly. We're going to talk about the field of business analytics and an overview of our new MS program in business analytics. Then we're going to have a conversation with a couple of our industry partners who are experts in the field, and then finally wrap up with next steps. So in addition to myself, we have with us today Sanjay Sanjeev Jagya, who is our Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in the Orfield College of Business and the individual who led the development of this program. We have Josh Knox from Google, who is the Engineering Program Manager, and we have Rich Clayton from Oracle, who is the VP of Business Analytics. And uh, both of these individuals have been very helpful to us in helping us develop our program. So to talk about the overview of, of the industry, um, we spent a fair amount of time talking to a lot of folks in the industry and looking at a lot of different programs that exist out in the field. And uh, what the industry really needs are individuals who can develop insights um, from data within the context of business issues and to be able to deploy that data for effective business solutions and input into good strategic decisions. And we heard over and over again that industry wants really well-rounded people who really understand business and are good team players and good communicators. There's huge demand in industry for uh, folks in this field. I've seen uh, uh, figures of everywhere from 300,000 open positions to 500,000 open positions. And it's predicted that by 2018 there will be 1.5 million uh, a shortage of 1.5 million people. These are huge numbers and who knows how accurate they are, but uh, I think we can be assured that there are tremendous opportunities out there for experts in the field. And why not? Because the ROI on dollars spent on uh, analytics are significant, estimated to be about 11x return. And Interestingly, so there are only a, uh, about 12% of executives actually have a good sense for how they could deploy data for good strategic purposes and for good return on investment, which means there's another 88% who maybe just have this nagging feeling that uh, they're, they're, they're missing an opportunity. And indeed, there's a ton of data out there, and the amount of that data that's actually being used for strategic business purposes is, is very low. Applications exist across all kinds of industries from communications to oil and gas in our field of education. Particular examples are uh, trying to predict when a, a student has made a bad choice about a major or they're about to drop out. Or in healthcare where uh, analytics is predicting when patients are likely to stop, to go off their meds and end up being having to be readmitted into hospitals. So lots of applications exist. So we developed this MS in Business Analytics to, to achieve three goals. First, to produce industry leaders in a rapidly evolving field to address the huge growing uh, number of unmet uh, needs that exist in industry and to collaborate with our business partners on developing a pool of analytic professionals. And as I've mentioned before, there are just tremendous opportunities for folks who are coming out with expertise in this field. It's one of the most uh, demanded skills that exists now, according to Burning Glass. The Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, shows the job category is expected to grow by 45% between 2008 and 2018, making it one of the fastest growing fields. And the salaries um, are, are extremely good, uh, annual average salaries of $171,000, almost $172,000. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to my colleague, Sanji, to talk more about the program. Hello. Um, so when we started about a year and a half ago, it was very clear to us there was tremendous need for a program in business analytics. But we wanted to make sure that we have a good team for the program. So we first started with faculty. We looked at our pool of faculty in the college and what their academic interests were, and what kind of industry experience that they had. So what was really interesting is that almost all areas 
were very well represented it, um, in business analytics. So we have a professor in finance whose primary interest is business analytics. We have a professor in economics, in accounting, in marketing, and information systems. So we wanted to develop a program which was truly interdisciplinary. And, and we were able to do that because we had the faculty who were interested in contributing to this program and also had tremendous industry experience in the field. So that was step number one. We had the ingredients. And then we wanted a niche. We wanted a theme. We wanted something that our program is famous for. And by talking to um, both directors of um, other programs around the country and also talking to business leaders in the field, the first thing that was made very clear to us is that the market is truly hungry for those who can ask questions, not only the ones who can answer every question, but also for people who can ask these questions. And again, it was clear to us that having a program through the business school where people understand the business acumen, they are the ones who could actually ask questions and then go through the techniques to, to come up with something which actually has value for the business. So that was our first step that we, we wanted people, we wanted to divide, divide our courses also in a way where quite a bit of focus is on asking questions. Um, then we wanted uh, something regarding the curriculum. How what kind of an approach do we really want to follow? And here there were uh, two types of approaches which are pretty well known. One is the data first approach where you write really complicated uh, computer codes and, and let the data do all the talking. And the other is where you have a model first approach where you actually build uh, a model to, to do predictive analytics. So there's an age-old problem, you know, the, to, to be able to distinguish between correlation and causation. So if you look at just data and you find that areas which have a lot of crime are also the areas which have a lot of cops. Now if you're doing your predictive analytics just on the basis of that, then the policy recommendation would be that in order to reduce crime, you reduce cops, and which we all know is ridiculous. Um, so there is that issue of you know what causes and what correlates. And by doing a model-first approach, we could actually develop models which, which can actually differentiate between the two types. And, and some issue, you know, models with instrumental variables and, and other techniques have been known in statistics and econometrics literature for decades. So that's something we could do. And we also have incredibly good faculty and talented faculty in the field of econometrics. So that's the approach we took. We thought we will have a program which has a model first approach. Another thing we were learning from um, industry uh, professionals was that people should be able to communicate. A common problem described to us was the CEO of a company asked a technical person to use data to answer a particular question. And this technical man or woman goes to his or her office, comes up with the answer, and now the CEO says, that's not, the, that's not what I really want to do. So what's really lacking in this scenario is that there was no back and forth. There was no communication. So again, we want to put a lot of emphasis on communication. You know, as I'm going through the curriculum, you will, you will see that there's a lot of emphasis on communication. And the end result for our program is to, to, to train managers. Yes, there is a lot of data crunching that goes along the way. There will be a lot of models and technology that we'll be learning, learning along the way. But the end product is that we are trying to make managers, not just number crunchers. Um, so as Scott mentioned, we do have an incredibly fine um, advisory board um, who are basically experts in this field. And we have people from Google, from Oracle. In fact, you'll be talking to somebody from Google and Oracle in a few minutes. But we also have people from Walmart, from Symantec, and Nest, and many other companies. So one thing that they, they suggested, which now we believe is immensely valuable, 
is that we will have two courses or eight units of courses which are basically collaborative industry projects where we actually go to our industry partners, we go to our BOB members and other industry partners and we get the data and we get the project from them and then we give it to students. Again, we do not provide the questions. We just give them the context, we give them the data, they come up with the question and they provide the answer. They work in a team, they get valuable experience working in a team for a client and again communicate the results to to, the, to, to, to our industry partners as well as to their professors to get credit. I'll quickly go over the curriculum now. So we have um, a course in data visualization and communication. You know, as I said, communication is going to be very important here. And then we have a course in statistics, we have a course in econometrics, and then computational methods, which will be based on the programming language R. Then we have a course in data management, data analytics, and the collaborative industry projects that I just talked about, which are for eight units. Then you have some electives here, more econometrics. You have a couple of courses in marketing. One would be marketing analytics, and the other is um, marketing research. And then you have a course um, in Bayesian econometrics as well. In terms of software, um, we'll be learning MS SQL Server, Oracle, MS Access. For programming language, there'll be SQL and R. For statistical analysis, we'll be using Stata, SAS, and R again. And for data visualization, we'll be using Tableau, R, and Excel. And for data and text mining, we'll be using SAS Enterprise Miner as well as SAS Text Miner. Um, I'll quickly like to now introduce our faculty. Um, so Eric Schaffrin will teach a course in computation with, with R, and Samuel Frame um, will teach a course in visualization where he'll be using R and Tableau. So Eric Schaffrin, before he got his PhD in economics, he actually has a master's degree in computer science from Cornell. So he's really the right person for that computation course. And Samuel Frame, he's actually done culinary analytics for restaurants, and he has worked doing risk modeling for Wells Fargo. So both of them have very fine industry experience. And Eric Schaffrin on the previous slide also worked for Oracle, Intel, and IBM. So Barry Floyd and Leda Chen will be teaching courses in data management and mining. And Barry is in widely traveled educator as well as consultant all across the globe um, with training in information systems. And Leda Chen um, has actually worked for Microsoft Asia Pacific as data analytics manager and before he, he came to Cal Poly. And, um, so, and he's also managed um, analytics projects for Microsoft Smart City Solution. So here are your three people um, doing statistical modeling um, in regular econometrics, financial econometrics, and Bayesian econometrics. Each one of these are highly reputed scholars in their field. Carlos is currently working on uh, evaluating the largest federally funded job training program in the US for disadvantaged, disadvantaged youth. Um, John James uh, worked in the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland before he came to Cal Poly. And Garland, he also has worked for Amazon where he was developing this really state-of-the-art software for doing forecasting. Uh, we'll now meet our marketing professors. Jeff Hess, um, before he came to Cal Poly, was vice president at Harris Interactive and TNS Research. And Brennan Davis worked as a data analytic person for Nissan Motors before he came to Cal Poly. So again, both of them bring incredibly good industry experience. Um, so here is Eduardo Zambrano and Garland again. They also do decision analysis. Um, Eduardo is currently working as a consultant to the UN program. He's redesigning the human development and the gender inequality index. And Garland, as I mentioned before, you know, has, has worked um, for Amazon. 
And finally, that's me uh, and, and Jean-Francois Coget. And I also have um, 20 plus years experience in applied statistics and econometrics. Um, I have authored a couple of highly successful books in business statistics, and I'm currently working on another book on data analytics. And Jean-Francois, he brings in the soft skills that, that our people still need. Um, so he's, he's an effective team collaborator, leadership leader, and, and also teaches interpersonal communication. So he'll be providing a lot of valuable assistance when people are uh, working on collaborative industry projects. So now we send the mic back to Scott to introduce our industry partners. I'm pretty excited about this, Angie. I think I'm going to apply to that program myself. <laughs> looks, looks, looks awesome. So now we're going to shift gears and talk to our industry partners. I'm going to ask them to uh, introduce themselves and, and share with you a little bit more about their backgrounds and their work. You want to start, Josh? Sure. Um, I'm Joshua Knox. I started at Google um, just under 10 years ago right out of grad school uh, at Cal Poly and had this program existed uh, back then, it probably would have been the go-to for my master's because um, it was really my, my interest even back then. I've spent the last 10 years working across our ad systems and analytics um, uh, at Google and I'm uh, excited to join you guys today and talk a little bit more about this program at Cal Poly. Great, thanks Rich. Good morning and uh, congratulations Scott and Sanjeev. This is a very, very exciting time for Cal Poly and I'm happy to be, uh, to, to be part of this. <clears throat> Good morning everyone. I'm Rich Clayton. I, I'm VP of Business Analytics for Oracle. Joined about eight and a half years ago um, when Oracle acquired an analytics company called Hyperion Solutions, uh, which predominantly served uh, CFOs and financial management leaders spent the last 25 years of my, my career in the analytics field and uh, various different roles. Today it's predominantly a marketing role where I'm, uh, I lead our, our marketing strategy for all the analytic products at Oracle. But before that, uh, started out in uh, public accounting and corporate finance and consulting and different roles um, and sort of learned the, the hard way about the opportunity of analytics. But um, it's been a field that's really changed in the last few years and excited to uh, to talk with you a little bit today. Well, Josh and Rich, thanks so much for spending time with us. You, we have a couple of individuals here who are deep into the into the field here. I'm going to start with the first question and uh, ask Rich to take the lead on that. What unique business challenges can an MS in business analytics help solve? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, Scott, and I think um, really <clears throat> there are many, many different challenges across industries and functions. You know, in agriculture, for example, we're trying to increase yield to, to, to feed the world. And data and analysis uh, provide a pretty important foundation for what's called precision farming, um, where now farmers are using data from tractors, uh, using geothermal data from satellites uh, to try to predict uh, outcomes in the field and try to minimize um, waste. Uh, in healthcare, you mentioned that you know analytics is not just uh, working on curing cancer, but also about using genome data for personalized medicine. Um, manufacturing, you know, maybe an old school industry, but uh, they're trying to do preventative maintenance on equipment because every hour that equipment isn't operational, it's not generating revenues and predicting that mean time to failure is, is important for their success. Uh, so it, just to give you a, a simple example, I work with a, a large door and window manufacturer in the Midwest and they're trying to create smart products and smart products mean that, that data from the product that's manufactured can be actually used as a revenue generating source. Um, sometimes it's called the Internet of Things or IoT, but um, what are they going to do with the data? So they're going to sell that information to real estate property managers, to security companies and police departments. So when bad people walk through your door or window, um, that, that can be detected sooner than later. So there's a tremendous number of opportunities. Uh, more traditional finance functions are even changing pretty rapidly. You know, it's not just about 
building budgets anymore. It's about predicting cash flow. And so if you go into finance and you don't have an understanding about data science and predictive analytics, as Sanjeev talked about a little bit, I think you'll be kind of missed and, and left behind. And so I think, there's, I think there's many, many different opportunities and challenges, but those are just a, a couple of examples. Those are great examples. I hear from my friends in uh, accounting, too, that the whole field of auditing is likely to be heavily impacted as yeah. well. And uh, Josh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think Rich gave some really good broad examples that illustrate clearly that it's not limited to a few specific functions or sp a few specific industries. It's really across the board. So in the same way that someone in the past maybe didn't need to have typing skills, but now in the 21st century and everything being computing-based, you know, you got to know how to use a keyboard. In the future, I think data is going to be one of those critical tools that everyone needs to understand. So the, the unique challenge is really to, to be able to build an organization that is data-driven. I've worked with a lot of different companies on the Google Analytics side of things that, you know, you talk to them, they're known for being very data-driven and data-forward and really still, I would say, that truly leveraging for the value of the data is, is in its infancy um, also across the board. So with all of this data is a real democratization of decision-making. Many people from the top to the bottom in an organization have access to this data and if you're able to come in, you know, make a oppression analysis, uh, suggest really valuable actions, I think that you can show your value to an organization and there's a, a tremendous opportunity there. So this great equalizer helps us make better decisions, you know, more civil discourse so that we can be more based on facts and not just opinions. Uh, opinions and that skill is a really important part of business when you build a judgment but I think it also needs to be balanced with, um, with some facts. So not just the highest paid person's opinion. So Great, great insights. So we'll move on to our second question. And uh, Josh, I'll ask you to take the lead on this. Uh, what do companies like Google and Oracle look for in a strong business analytics applicant? I think it was something that you and Sanjeev touched on earlier. And it's I, I was looking earlier just to, to get a sense for the number of jobs uh, that Google currently has listed um, with analyst or analysis um, in the title. And there are more than 350. And, in having worked with people in different functions at work and, and uh, external partners, I think a key piece is the ability to weave a story with these meaningful insights from data. So that focus that was being described, not just on the technical, but also on the business, is really a critical piece. Um, so I think a lot of times what we look for when we're hiring people into these types of roles um, is that ability to, to build a story with the data um, but also to be action-oriented. It's not just about reporting. It's great to pat yourself on the back when you launch something and you see all these great performance metrics coming through, um, but that's not the reporting is not the point. Um, getting things set up and, and getting reporting built is, is a, a very small part of the, the overall equation. So materially impacting the bottom line with actions based on this data uh, is really the key, and um, people with experience doing that um, seems to be still a pretty rare skill set. And Rich? Yeah, so, you know, in, in my area, we look for, for folks uh, similar to what Josh said, but who are curious, you know, uh, candidates that are want to challenge the biases and, and look beyond just testing their hypothesis, uh, but really curious about discovering patterns that perhaps people didn't know, but not just for sort of intellectual curiosity, but to Josh's point, putting it into action. Um, so I think it's critical, and, and you all have, have um, I think, put a curriculum together that embraces this idea, but we look for people that don't just have strong technical skills in analyzing information, but can also put that in context to what's trying to be decided or acted on right now. Um, so that storytelling piece that Josh mentioned, I think, especially in large organizations, is pretty essential. Um, and last point I just add is that, 
you know, data is never clean, right? It's, it's, it's always have complexities and, and it's never as simple as it looks. And so we look for folks that have sort of a design orientation um, for improving analytic process because you can't wait for perfect data. Um, you've got to be creative. You've got to be sort of scrappy, if you will, in solving the analytical challenges and cleaning the data at the same time. So it's, it's not just a, a sequential but a networked approach. So what I'm hearing is that the demands are, are pretty sophisticated and certainly you can see why a, a master's degree uh, which allows a, a depth of study is, is needed to, to really fulfill your, what you're looking for. Absolutely. So we'll move on to our third question now. What types of career growth can an analytics leader expect? And Josh, why don't we start with you for this question? Sure. Um, I thought this was a, a good one because even my, my uh, myself, I've noticed um, some very interesting trends in um, in the business world and, and industry. Uh, a friend who was a product manager uh, who I had worked with uh, on Google Analytics is now the chief data officer for Dow Jones, and I hadn't really heard uh, the title chief data officer previously. Um, and poking around a little bit, it still seems to be a somewhat uncommon role, uh, but something that I really would, would bet on becoming more prevalent uh, in industry in the future. Um, so chief information officer, chief data officer. So in terms of career growth, I mean, that's basically all the way to the top to the executive suite. Um, and over time, you see, you know, the, the executive officers in the major corporations of the world, uh, you know, you see shifting patterns in terms of their backgrounds. You know, maybe engineering was a common um, you know, background for people who then make it to the executive suite for certain industries, and then, um, you know, maybe law for some point of time was was one of those, and or accounting things, skills like that. I think data is um, and, and analysis uh, is really going to be one of those skill sets and backgrounds where you start to see people moving into the executive suite who who are conversant and capable uh, and comfortable in that world. Um, so, you know, people who actually understand the data, I think, have a real advantage, and especially, you know, whether you're starting from the top, the middle, the bottom, um, being, a, being able to, to dive into the data really allows you to understand the business in a very critical way, uh, and oftentimes you're one of few who really has that understanding, um, which really opens up opportunities. So, um, you know, countless sources point to the tremendous growth of jobs um, requiring these skills, but this really gets to not just getting in the door and getting a job, but what is the future? And I think that's a really big, important part of feeling fulfilled in your career and, you know, your career being such an important part of your life and, and how much time you spend every day um, at work, you know, it, I think it's a pretty critical piece and, and I really think that not only is it an, an, interest, an interesting job, but it is an interesting job with a great future potential. It's a very motivational response. Uh, Rich? You know, I think a couple things that come to mind when we ponder this question is, uh, first of all, I think that many times the perception is that, well, I have to aspire to be a data scientist in this field. And clearly, I think, as you've mentioned, um, that's not really the case. While there are you know, plenty of roles and jobs for um, actuarials and actuaries and data scientists, I think the broader business market is the one that's that's in such great need. Um, so much so that companies are now creating new executive roles called chief data officers, which in my assessment is not a code word for IT or a technology person, but it's a new role that they're creating to drive innovation um, and create data capital inside their companies um, by using it as I described in the window and door manufacturer. Um, so I think I think folks that, that pursue an advanced degree in analytics have lots of different opportunities. Um, my view is that specialization is really essential um, and that analytics is one that will open many, many doors for, uh, for folks that have an appreciation. So, you know, if you start in marketing, you know, you might go into a marketing operations role, uh, lead a marketing operations team in my organization and most organizations, that's essentially the chief of staff for the chief marketing officer. Um, in finance, it you know could be a career path that in, includes um, running the head of uh, planning and analysis or VP of planning and analysis in organizations. But I, I really do think that 
analytics is the new business language and it does provide lots of different career paths uh, if you have an appreciation for it. Some tremendous opportunities. Well, we have one last question for Josh and Rich. How does the Cal Poly MS and Business Analytics program stand out from other programs? And Rich, you want to take the lead on this one? Absolutely. Well, Scott, as you know, I'm, I'm very excited to work with you, the faculty and administration. I, I, I think uh, what you're doing is, is very, very unique. Um, it's, analytics is a field I've dedicated my life to, professional life to, and uh, uh, really honored to work with Cal Poly on this. Uh, there's a few things that, that kind of stand out for me. First is your interdisciplinary approach. I think connecting the dots across these academic fields is very important. Uh, and very unique in terms of your strategy. I think a lot of programs out there today are really uh, one-dimensional, and I think Cal Poly is, is, uh, is very unique. Uh, the second thing is that <clears throat> your approach and learn by doing, I think, is distinctive because data is a doing thing. Um, it changes quickly. Um, to Sanjeev's point, you know, the questions are new, and your approach in connecting students with real data sets and real businesses and real challenges is, is something I think is, is going to be set your students apart um, when, they, when they come out of the program. Um, you know, I think the, the, the fact that you have this uh, blended curriculum is important. I also think that the connection to your econometrics background is special um, and an important part of the, of the strategy. So, I think um, the students that come from your program will, will have many, many opportunities and uh, look forward to working with you on, on the future on this. Great. Thank you, Rich. And uh, Josh, anything to add? Yeah, I think um, you know, Cal Poly has a lot of advantages, um, especially with regards to this MS and business analytics. Um, I think as Sanjeev and Rich alluded to, a lot of the the programs in this area, first of all, I think it's a, it's a fairly rare thing to have such a degree, um, but a lot of the programs that I've seen tend to chase people away because they're very heavily focused on the computational side of things. Um, and as was alluded to, it's really critical in, to understand the, the practical implications of the data and the actions that you're suggesting based on that data. So there really needs to be an intuition for the, the communications and the business side and the interpersonal and some of those soft skills, which is really reflected in the curriculum um, and it being centered in the business school. So, you know, how do you get the right people on board? What are the motivators for those groups of people who are at play with these, you know, actions that you're taking based on data? If you come in and say, you know, well, you've been doing everything wrong historically and everything that you should do is completely counter to anything you've done before and we're going to have to, you know, slash and burn, that may not be a, an, a suggestion that is actionable uh, not because the data doesn't show it to be true, but because it's it's approached in, in some of of an impractical way. Um, so, you know, I think that as well as the industry connections that we've seen, you know, it's been very illuminating to participate with the advisory board uh, and give suggestions about, you know, common pitfalls when people are educating people who enter this field, um, some of the oversights, some of the, the weaknesses in the candidate pool. Um, when we go out there and try and hire for these 350 plus jobs that are open, at Google. Um, so, you know, I think it's that mix of business and technical with the focus on group work, you know, and, and really the bread and butter of, of Cal Poly, the learn by doing approach that sets it apart. Well, great. And thank you so much again for spending time with us today and all the time you've helped us in designing this program. And I think in addition to the polytechnic and learn by doing uh, aspects that are so deeply embedded in the Cal Poly ethos. I think another is just partnering with industry to make sure that we're designing programs, delivering programs that, that meet the industry needs. And you two have been instrumental in helping this. So let's move on to next steps and turn it back over to Sanjeev. Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the prerequisites for the program. So you need a bachelor's degree. It really doesn't matter what your degree is in, in. It could be math, it could be statistics, it could be business, it could be engineering, um, anything. What we really require is your interest in quantitative thinking. And, and that's essential 
and also that you have taken the basic quantitative courses. Um, we are not asking for a whole lot in terms of prerequisites, but these are the bare minimum. So we need two college level courses in statistics, one college level course in calculus, and one college level course in linear algebra. And as I said before, these are minimum. Um, the more you come with, the better qualified you would be for a program like that and to benefit from a program like that. Uh, sometimes we we hear from people who have taken courses in statistics and calculus and perhaps not in linear algebra and they are still very interested in applying. So we will have a conditional admit where the cover letter or the or the letter we'll send out, the decision letter, will state very clearly what kind of remedial courses you'll need to take before you actually start taking courses from the program. Um, in terms of getting ready, have take your GRE and GMAT, um, or one of the two, if you have not done that already. Um, we don't have, again, a magic number of GMAT or GRE score which will bring you in. We look at your GMAT GRE scores, we look at your GPA, we look at your statement of purpose, we also look at your letters of recommendation. So it, it's kind of, we look at all those things to decide who gets in and who has to wait. Um, again, it's difficult to come up with a number, but if I were to say a number, I would say we need you know at least 600 on GMAT. And on the quantitative portion of GRE, we need about 160. Um, but again, the more the better. And if you don't have those thresholds met, you may still be admitted if everything else about your application is compelling. Um, our program has still not been formally approved by the chancellor. Uh, we are expecting it to happen anytime soon, um, hopefully over the next two or three weeks. But until the program is approved, uh, we will not be taking in your applications. But you can be ready for it. You can do your scores, GMAT and GRE, if you haven't done that, and get your package in place so that when it does open up, you can apply right away. We will be sending you an email when admissions opens. And we also encourage you to look at our website for updates. Scott, back to you. Okay, well, so just to wrap up, I want to thank Josh and Rich again and Sanji for joining us today and thank everybody who has been listening in and uh, hope that you've learned something about the field of business analytics and something about our program. We'd love to uh, see you in that program. You know, the demand has uh, grown so quickly here. We worked very hard last year from scratch to develop this program and, and get it through the approval system at Cal Poly and into the Chancellor's office in record time. Uh, we've, the feedback that we've received is really not substantive to the, the curriculum itself um, from the, the Chancellor's office and we feel confident we can address the couple issues that they pointed out uh, very rapidly. So, uh, so look for the approval to, uh, to be on the, on the web page soon and please let us know if we can answer any questions and, and have a good day. Thank you.